St. Barnabas, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Throughout the centuries, our creed has been attacked and challenged by ideas determined later to be heretical. The only part never to be challenged is the doctrine of creation. Until now. This is from Pope Benedict. I must draw attention to the almost total disappearance of the theology of the doctrine of creation. The decline in metaphysics has accompanied the decline in the doctrine of creation. So what do we affirm? Credo in unum Deum. The first thing we must face when we say we believe in God, do we understand God as necessary or contingent? What do we mean by that? Contingent is that which is but does not have to be. A contingent being depends on another for its existence. Everything in the universe is contingent. And what we are facing is this idea that there is, I won't use infinite, infinite because that's an overworked word today that is not understood. Let's use the word endless succession of contingencies, leading to Stephen Hawking's declaration that the universe created itself, which is one of the most absurd statements ever made by a man. If everything in the universe is contingent, therefore there is and there must be a necessary being outside of the universe. Why? Why can we assert that if everything in the universe is contingent, then there must be a necessary being? And it has to do with this endless succession all right, you can use the old example of the chicken and the egg. All right, if there's a chicken, there must have been an egg. If there's an egg, there must have been a chicken. If there's a chicken, there must have been an egg, and so forth. You cannot continue that infinitely because nothing can create nothing. Credo et unum deum patrimum nepotentem. If a contingent being depends on another for its existence, there must be a necessary being who has being of himself and from no other. If everything that exists need not exist, then it follows that without the creative act of the necessary being who must exist, there must have been a time when there was nothing at all, except, of course, this necessary being of God. From the writings of St. Paul to the Colossians, God hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the remission of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For in him were all things created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominations or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and in him, and he is before all, and by him all things consist. Again, to emphasize, for in him were all things created in heaven and on earth. Again, affirming that everything that we see in the universe is contingent. Credo et unum deum patrum omnipotentum factorum celiatere visibilium omnium et invisibilium. That is what we say we believe, how much we understand it uh, in the church at large today is questionable, perhaps. But this is where scripture begins. When God began to reveal himself to humanity in written form, he started with the account of our origins. And this is what we have forgotten. We as the church at large in the 21st century. 
This is very interesting. Pope Francis, in his first encyclical, the church, like every family, passes on to her children the whole story of her memories. Genesis, we could, in that terminology, call the memory of our origins. Chapter 1, God creates the world and everything in it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Chapter 2, focus on the creation of man and woman as the crowning achievement of creation. And in that, we have the declaration of God that it is not good that the man should be alone. He wants there to be more humans. Chapter 3, the fall. And the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden. Once again, I will repeat that one of the ideas that we must continue to emphasize in this generation is that we live in a fallen world. If we do not take that into account, then the evolutionary hypothesis comes to us and says, no, we just live in an incomplete world, and God is in the process of completing it. Chapter 4 recounts for us the results of the fall, or we have uh, the, the murder of uh, Abel by Cain, and then we have this interesting acclamation of Lamech. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech, seventy-sevenfold. And so, in the results of the fall, if we have, by the way, notice, okay, that Abel is actually mentioned in the Roman canon, that is, Eucharistic Prayer 1, all right? Now, if Abel is not a historical person, what are we praying? We're praying that God will accept our sacrifice of the Holy Mass as he accepted the sacrifice of Abel, the just. But, of course, Abel was a myth. So what does that make of our sacrifice? So liturgy supports scripture and church teaching, as it should. And, by the way, why does the blood of Abel cry out from the ground if death has been the norm for millions of years? What's the big deal? One more death in the millions of death, according to the evolutionary hypothesis. And then, couldn't we look at Cain and Lamech as heroes in the survival of the fittest? So, totally apart from a literal or metaphorical interpretation, what do Genesis 3 and 4 say? There was an ideal setting. There was a human act of disobedience to God. This act ruined the ideal setting, and two paths diverged for humanity after this. Now, we could grant to uh, those uh, scholars who are infected with evolutionary thinking that they can dismiss this as allegory, uh, but nevertheless, they have to agree this is the story that Genesis 3 and 4 tell us. Two paths diverge, as I said. The first path is illustrated in uh, verses 25 and 26 of chapter 4. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son, and called his name Seth, for she said, God has appointed for me another child instead of Abel, for Cain slew him. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. This is one path that humanity takes. Those who choose to honor their creator, those who choose to follow the path back to the paradise they have lost. The other path, then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch and built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Ered, to Ered was the father of Mahujael, and Mahujael the father of Methuselah, and Methuselah the father of Lamech. Uh, just a note here, there are two Enochs in Genesis, okay, one in this second line and the other that we know uh, was taken. Path one accepts that we are in exile from our true home. 
We cannot communicate with God as we were designed to. We are helpless to reverse the process and the whole world has fallen from its original goodness. Man's intellect has fallen and does not always reason properly. But there will be a redeemer. That's from the third chapter, the proto evangel Our path back home will be full of difficulty and opposition. And those on this path worship God as creator. Path two supposes that the world as it is is our true home. That is, there is no fall. It posits a world, and by the way, I mentioned this in my homily, but I think it's worth repeating. If we do not understand and accept the premise that we live in a fallen world, and we talk to people about an omnipotent God who created all things, they look at the condition of the world, all right, with death, disease, decay, disaster, and they have to conclude, is that the best God can do? I don't need him. And so human activity kicks in and says, we can create a more perfect world. And that's very much, whether it's conscious or, not, or acknowledged or not acknowledged, that's very much in the mind of unbelievers today and even in believers. Path 2 supposes that there may or may not be a God, but communication with him is not necessary. This would be the deism. All right, if you want to say God created everything, that's fine, but then he went on vacation, all right, and he's not really concerned with us. The world is on a path of self-perfection, is what they suppose. We can improve and perfect the world. Wonderful illustration of this, I remember someone recounting for me, he lived out in the San Francisco area after one of their terrible earthquakes. And uh, after things settled down, he was standing in line at the bank. And uh, of course there was a long line. And uh, he overheard the conversation of the lady in front of him who said, you know, the government really ought to do something about these earthquakes. <laughs> But that's the, th you see, once we go down this path, we start uttering utter nonsense. Man's intellect and ingenuity are trusted above all else. We do not need redemption, only good examples to follow. Our path to an omega point will essentially be governed by the survival of the fittest. And God, if there is a God, is not really a creator as much as a sort of superintendent. So Genesis, again, looking at it in the words of Pope Francis as a memory of our origins, those on path one believe Genesis one and two. Those on path two dismiss Genesis one and two, but we have something in between those two. Those who straddle the two distort Genesis 1 and 2. And there are ample examples of that that I will demonstrate. Now the structure of Genesis 1, all right, uh, six literal days. There was evening and morning one day, that's the Hebrew words there. And evening and morning the second day. And evening and morning were the third day. And the evening and morning were the fourth day so forth with the fifth day. And God saw all the things that he had made and they were very good and the evening and morning were the sixth day. Now we have to ask, all right, uh, God was not writing a children's book where quite often in children's books repetition is used as you know, okay? And there is a reason why God used this kind of language, naming each day. It's up to us to decide whether uh, he made a mistake in being so uh, rep repetitive or whether he's trying to communicate something to us. And he blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Now it could not be any clearer. 
until we try to disbelieve this. It's absolutely clear, even some liberal biblical scholars will say, oh, I perfectly understand what this is saying, I just don't believe it's true. These are um, the, uh, the arguments of, uh, uh, of Father Workowitz, okay? Considering that yom, that is that, that Hebrew word that just popped up on the screen, it means day is never used in sacred scripture for a period of time of definite length other than an actual day. Considering the hermeneutical principle of Leo the Thirteenth, that scripture must be understood in its literal and obvious sense unless reason or necessity forces us to do otherwise, and considering the near unanimous belief in the fathers and doctors of the church, and considering that the creation day is the prototype of the natural day which sets the rhythm of our lives and of life on earth in general, and considering the fact that the natural sciences are unable to confirm or refute it, his conclusion there is no justification for a Catholic to deny that God created the world in six natural days. Let's go back and look at each one of these suppositions. Considering that Yom is never used in sacred scripture for a period of time of definite length other than a natural day, here is what one current author wrote. And it was not in neat succession that the stars were hung and the green of the fields created. It was rather in complex ways over vast periods of time that the earth and the universe were constructed as we know them. The words of Pope Benedict in one of his earlier books. Though straddling the two, the two paths, they distort Genesis 1 and 2. The second supposition, considering the hermeneutical principle of Leo the 13th, that scripture must be understood in its literal and obvious sense unless reason or necessity forces us to do otherwise. If we accept, this is a little booklet that circulated in the 70s and 80s and it's representative of the uh, thinking that permeated uh, across the church at that time that is still there in the minds and hearts of people. If we accept this primitive, a pejorative term, of course, as it's used there, meaning literal, interpretation of Genesis, there is no possibility of evolution. Sometimes we need to listen to our critics. They're telling us, okay, there's no possibility of evolution as read, in, as the creation account reads in sacred scripture. So those on path one believe that Genesis 1 and 2 are literally true. The third supposition, considering the near unanimous belief of the fathers and doctors of the church. Once again, a quote from Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI. The obscuring of faith in creation, which eventually led to its almost complete disappearance, is closely connected with the spirit of modern entity. It is a fundamental part of what constitutes modern entity. To go straight to the point, the foundations of modern entity are the reason for the disappearance of creation from the horizons of historically influential thought. Very strong statement, but unfortunately he tries to straddle the two ideas. We'll have more from that work to show where he like many others, has granted a sort of infallibility to the world of science, rather than challenging it. The fourth supposition, considering that the creation day is the prototype of the natural day, which sets the rhythm for our lives and life on earth in general, 
this little booklet again, the discoveries of science in the evolutionary field certainly give us a much more solid base. Much more solid base than God who cannot lie. Upon which to make theological deductions, then did the speculations of the ancients who had no way of testing their static theory of creation. If the authors of Genesis were alive today, they would not propound a static theory of creation, if indeed they ever really did. I want to tell you this little booklet, I'll show you later in one of the slides, had an imprimatur and ego obstat from an American bishop. Those on path to dismiss Genesis 1 and 2. The fifth supposition, considering the fact that the natural sciences are unable to confirm or refute it, again from this little booklet, again, uh, I don't think very many people have a copy of this anymore, but I think it's illustrative of the type of thinking that, uh, that got loose, the Pandora's box, if you will, that got opened. We cannot deny the theory of evolution and stubbornly base this denial on what the Bible tells us of creation in the book of Genesis. The sciences investigating the past history of our universe and the... Stop right there. How in the world can you investigate a past history? You can't bring it into the laboratory, you can't perform experiments, you can't repeat anything. Investigating the past history of our universe and the prehistory of man, again, how are you going to investigate prehistory? There's nothing to investigate. Present clear evidence that evolution has occurred in the past and is now occurring over the entire universe as we know it. Those on path to dismiss Genesis 1 and 2. Going back to Father Workowitz's conclusion, there is no justification to deny that God created the world in six natural days. This is from the EWTN website. So from the Catholic point of view, the scientific questions of evolution are largely left open to debate. Did you know that? Evolutionary hypotheses which attempt to explain the development of living things may be accepted except where they conflict with these few explicit truths. I think in our introductory session we had a clear presentation that this is not the case. Again from this little booklet, as scientists develop and discover new insights concerning our world and ourselves, non-scientists must be willing. Say, you're a non-scientist. Okay, so you've just been relegated to a lower status. Okay, just as, as Pam said, I have a lab coat on. I know what I'm talking about. Okay, non-scientists must be willing and even anxious to reinterpret their religious beliefs in light of the new evidence. What is this doing but transferring infallibility from the church to science? so called. Again, there must be another story of our origin of our world. God didn't tell us the truth. One that modern scientific discovery is relating to us by every discovery brought to light with sophisticated scientific equipment. You see, we have to be able to challenge the language that they use. Modern, well that's good, isn't it? Why do we call the synthesis of all errors modernism then? Every discovery by sophisticated scientific equipment, sophisticated scientific equipment, of course, is better than simply believing that Jesus sent us the spirit of truth. This is the story of a God who, by the very act of his creation, implanted the dynamic of growth and the impulse to perfection in his world. So, God did not create a perfect world. He created one that is in process through death and mutation. Again from Cardinal Ratzinger's book, In the Beginning. 
Yet these words of Genesis 1 give rise to a certain conflict. They are beautiful and familiar, but are they also true? Everything seems to speak against it. For science has long since disposed of the concept that we have just now heard. <coughs> The idea of a world that is completely comprehensible in terms of space and time and the idea that creation was built up piece by piece over the course of seven days. How sad. First of all, it wasn't done over seven days, was it? It was six days, okay. You can see this, you know this, this is what we're up against. All right, that people are intimidated by the very word science. And that we must bow to whatever a scientist says, that we have to somehow assimilate whatever they're saying into our belief system. And unfortunately, even good men are pulled into that whirlpool. Uh, this is uh, a book called God and the Evolving Universe, The Next Step in Personal Evolution. How about that? According to Ernest Mayer, the eminent historian of biological thought, evolution, quote, has been confirmed so completely that modern biologists consider it simply as a fact. All right, again, in that introductory session, we talked about the icons of evolution. We'll show that every one of them is not what it presents itself to be. No other scientific finding is as important in revealing the astonishing story of our universe and humankind's role in it in its further advance. So you can see these people are caught up with this idea that we are on a march towards something much better and it's unstoppable. <clears throat> and we can't blame them, that has to be their only hope. If they deny the hope of the resurrection, if they deny the hope that our Lord Jesus Christ brought to us. There is no justification to deny that God created the world in six natural days. A distressingly large, oh, this was an interesting book that I found called Unscientific America. How scientific illiteracy, illiteracy threatens our future, okay? <laughs> Um, very interesting. A distressingly large number of Americans refuse to accept either the fact or the theory of evolution, the scientifically undisputed okay, explanation of the origin of our species and the diversity of life on Earth. God has not left us without witness. These people were, were totally upset that some people just don't buy it. Public opinion surveys taken repeatedly with invariant question wording showed that an alarming percentage of Americans agree with this stunning statement. God created human beings pretty much in their present form at one time within the last 10,000 years or so. Roughly 46% of the public holds this anti-evolutionist, young earth creationist, and scientifically illiterate view. I think we ought to applaud. <laughs> Again, in the same book, we've already seen that an alarming percentage of our citizens, 46%, subscribe to young earth creationism, the scientifically untenable idea that God created the earth and everything on it within the last 10,000 years. And as with evolution, so with the Big Bang, less than 40% of Americans can correctly, correctly, they say, answer the question, the universe began with a huge explosion, true or false? In Japan and South Korea, by contrast, the number is over 60%. Now, I want to share that with you as a word of hope. If these statistics are actually true, and there's a large number of people out there that simply aren't buying the quote-unquote scientific lies that are presented to us, then we have to ask, why are we having such difficulty getting any traction? And I think that is more of a spiritual question than it is uh, any kind of methodological question. I think we need to understand that the devil is called the prince of this world. 
and that we really are up against our battles, not against flesh and blood, St. Paul says, but against principalities and powers and spiritual forces in our places. And that there are, there is, there must be some controlling uh, cabal, if you will, of diabolical uh, origin that is able to maintain this grip on people's thinking, okay? And uh, so if we persist, if we continue to trust in God, I think we can see a great day of the reversal of all of this. But it will take our prayers, our penances, and our tireless work. As we have seen, the facts of evolution have reinforced the strict materialism of many scientists and lay people, but they also can broaden our vision of the divine eminence. And more than that, they must be addressed by anyone who views the world as a whole and cares about humankind's destiny. You see, they're tugging on your heartstrings. You've got to believe in evolution if you really care about humanity. Which is why they are central to the philosophies of great modern thinkers such as Henry Bergson, Alfred North Whitehead, Pierre de Chardin, and Sri Aurobindo. Okay? These were the great thinkers, in case you didn't, didn't know. <laughs> the Darwinian Revolution. All right, there's an admission that it was a revolution. Further advanced this trend of desacralizing nature. Throughout the first half of the 19th century, and especially in England, many thinkers still looked to the natural world for scientific evidence of divine handiwork. They held that its intricate wonders, particularly the seemingly miraculous contrivances that allow living organisms to thrive, such as the eye, constituted proof of the designer's active hand. Oh, how foolish these primitive thinkers were. Yet Darwin devastatingly unseated the idea that living things provide evidence of the divine in their bodily structures or attributes. Instead, a directionless process acting over long periods of time, natural selection, could account for the diversity of life as well as the adaptive efficiency of its organs and organisms. Species haven't been created at fixed moments in time by an intelligent agent and their identities weren't static. They did not constitute the obvious evidence of God's existence that so many had assumed. Once again, religion would have to retreat in the face of scientific advance. You know this, but it bears repeating, this is what we are up against. To try to say that there's no harm being done in trying to meld the current scientific thoughts with our faith. I, uh, as, as innumerable, I, I just, my heart sinks every time I hear another man has produced a video or a YouTube or anything at all, and, and the tagline is something like, there is no conflict between faith and science. All right, uh, that they've been saying that going on two generations now, and I think it's time to read the report card and ask, so how's that working out for us, okay? This is really attracting the young people to our church, isn't it, and to our faith. Uh, obviously, if there's no conflict, then someone is going to be more naturally, uh, is going to more naturally gravitate toward the field of science because it seems to be more certain. Again, from this little booklet, I'll show you the, top, the uh, cover of it and then. We are forced to other conclusions about the origin of the world and man's role in it that may be disturbing to one who does not see the implications in the acceptance of the theory of evolution as it is applied to the creative act of God. That's a theistic evolutionary statement. Among these additional conclusions, we must include questions about Adam and Eve, aspect, original sin, the role of Christ in redemption, the meaning of the resurrection, the nature of heaven, and the history of salvation. This or these authors are at least honest. They are saying, if evolution is true, we have to revise our entire structure of doctrine. We've got to rethink what original sin is, therefore what the sacraments are and what they do. Since faith is one, it must be professed in all 
its purity and integrity precisely because all the articles of faith are interconnected. To deny one of them, even of those that seem least important, is tantamount to distorting the whole. Each period of history can find this or that point of faith easier or harder to accept. You catch this? To deny one aspect of our faith is to destroy the unity of our faith. Hence the need for vigilance in ensuring that the deposit of faith is passed on in its entirety, entirety and that all aspects of the profession of faith are duly emphasized. Indeed, in as much as the unity of faith is the unity of the church, to subtract something from the faith is to subtract something from the veracity of communion. Again, the words of Pope Francis, Lumen Fidei. Thomas Aquinas, accordingly, it is clear that the opinion is false of those who assert that it mattered not to the truth of faith what opinions one holds about creatures so long as one has a right opinion about God. Since error concerning creatures by subjecting the human mind to causes other than God amounts to a false opinion. This reluctance to speak about the creation account in Genesis is noticeable even in the dogmatic constitution of divine revelation of the Vatican Council II. Its summary of the history of salvation begins with Abraham, not Adam. The words of Father Warkowitz. This is that little booklet I was talking about. A little, a little book, it sold for 35 cents back in um, 1976 when it was published. Again, I, I don't think it's uh, anything other than representative of a lot of thinking that was going on at that time. Evolution and Religion, notice the subtitle, New Insights. <coughs> notice that it has a needle obstat and an imprimatur. And that's the whole series there of other little booklets that they put it. Let's go back. Credo et unum Deum Patrum Omnipotentem Factorum Charietere Visibilium Omnium et Invisibilium. Sammy Davis Jr. in Porgy and Bess. Necessarily so. The things that you're liable to read in the Bible, it ain't necessarily so. All right, regardless of how many people heard that song, that thought permeates the minds of those that we minister to and interact with in our world today. Peter, St. Peter, wrote this Knowing this first, that in the last days there shall come deceitful scoffers walking after their own lust, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the time that the fathers slept, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they are willfully ignorant of that the heavens were before and the earth out of water and through water consisted by the word of God. It's amazing that our Lord gave us the insight to St. Peter to be able to see the battle that we are fighting today. And the Pontifical Biblical Commission in 1909, when it still represented magisterial authority, allowed interpreters of scripture to argue that Yom means the natural day or that it means a certain space of time. Today we hear the Big Bang which happened billions of years ago and with which the universe began its expansion, an expansion that continues to occur without interruption. Again, who said that? Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger. You see what he did? We hear the Big Bang. He doesn't challenge that. He says, all right, if a scientist says it, it must be true. But what does that do to what St. Peter said would happen in the last days? Father Workowitz 
but it is out of bounds to assert that a certain space of time means undefined millions of years because this cannot be established as a necessary interpretation. From the Roman martyrology, okay, I don't know, I hope that you still hear this proclaimed. <clears throat> as it was originally written. The 25th day of December in the 5,199th year of the creation of the world from the time when God in the beginning created the heavens and the earth, the 2,957th year after the flood, and you know how that goes. The point is not the accuracy of these numbers, but the scope of them. It's been rewritten, did you know that? Here it is now. Today, the 25th day of December, unknown ages from the time when God created the heavens and the earth, and then formed man and woman in his own image several thousand years after the flood. Rather than trying to precisely locate creation in our history, it simply bows to the current uh, thinking of science and puts it all in a fog. Is, evolutionary, uh, is evolution a theory, a system, or a hypothesis? It is much more. These are words of Thierry de Chardin. It is a general condition to which all theories, all hypotheses, all systems must bow and which they must satisfy henceforward if they are to be thinkable and true. Evolution is a light illuminating all facts, a curve that all lines must follow. A direct substitution of that spirit of truth promised to us by our Lord saying now scientists have given us a spirit of truth, it's, the, it's evolution. Here's another one, okay. Have you noticed how, how people use the word scholar as, as that appeal to authority? All right, you say the word scholar, it's like, oh, okay, I'm not a scholar. All right. Scholars generally agree that the Hebrew word yom used in Genesis 1 was intended by the sacred author to mean a literal natural day and not an indefinite period of time. Now in this case, this is Father Warkowitz. I think he's using the word scholar properly, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, how it's improperly used. And this is true. Like I said, even the scholars who don't believe that it's true say, yes, this is what the text presents to us. The liberal or unbelieving expositor of Genesis has no problem with the text. It's obvious to him that Genesis 1 presents creation and world building in 144 hours and that Genesis 5 and 11 provide a chronology of the world from creation to Abraham. This is from James Jordan, Creation in Six Days. The modernists and the unbeliever do not accept the Genesis account as historically true. For them, it is a myth, but they perceive no problems or ambiguities with the text Nothing that indicates gaps in the chronology or some odd kind of day in Genesis 1. Father Workowitz again. The great majority of the fathers of the church believe that God created the world in six natural days. None of them profess belief that God took eons of time to create the world. St. Ephraim the Syrian. So let no one think there is anything allegorical in the words of the six days. No one can rightly say that the things pertaining to these days were symbolic, nor can anyone say that they were meaningless names or that other things were symbolized for us by their names. We do not have a theology of the doctrine of creation adequate for the 21st century because great confusion has been introduced into the thinking of Catholics by the theory of evolution and its associated doctrines, which are rooted in some false claims of natural scientists. Sometimes what scientists present as truth is simply opinion based on false philosophy. Great confusion, false claims, and false philosophy. St. Paul, again, in his letter to the Colossians, I say this so no one may deceive you by spacious arguments. See to it that, you, that no one captivate you 
with an empty, seductive philosophy according to human tradition, according to the elemental powers of the world, and not according to Christ. Again, the words of, Saint, or of Father Wolkowitz talking about false philosophy, exactly what St. Paul warned us against. Let no one deceive you with empty arguments. Again, the words of St. Paul, words of uh, the Apostle John, I write to you these things about those who would deceive you. Children, let no one deceive you again, St. John. Great confusion again, as Father Wolfram has said. Uh, again, uh, St. Paul in 2 Thessalonians, let no one deceive you in any way. You have to ask, why does this warning against deception show up so often in our New Testament? The church was not even 100 years old yet. Do not be, be deceived, my beloved brothers, St. James. Do not be deceived, St. Paul, 1 Corinthians. We do not have a theology of the doctrine of creation adequate for the 21st century. Again, continuing in 1 Corinthians, let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you considers himself wise in this age, isn't that what's going on? Let him become a fool so as to become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in the eyes of God. If we say we are without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. False claims. Satan will be released from his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations. Did you know there was so much warning in Scripture about being deceived? False messiahs and false prophets will arise and they will perform signs and wonders so great as to deceive, if that were possible, even the elect. Great confusion, false claims, false philosophy. Again, uh, St. Paul, this time in 2 Corinthians, but I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts may be corrupted from a sincere and pure commitment to Christ. For if someone comes and preaches another Jesus than the one we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it well enough. A scathing condemnation to this generation, though it was written in a previous generation. The woman was deceived and transgressed. Therefore God is sending them a deceiving power so that they may believe the lie, that all who have not believed the truth but have approved wrongdoing may be condemned. Now the serpent, this is going back to our origins. The serpent was more subtle than any other wild creature that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God say? That subtle insertion of doubt was the beginning of everything and it is still with us. Did God say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman was deceived. And God is sending them a deceiving power so that they may believe the lie. We must carefully observe the rule so wisely laid down by St. Augustine not to depart from the literal and obvious sense except only where reason makes it untenable or necessity requires. I don't have a clock here. What, oh, here, what, what time is it? No, 25, you're fine, Father. Okay. Pope Leo the 13th and probably the Decimus Deus. All right, one of the things that you'll run across in Catholic study Bibles is that they'll take you to Genesis 1 and say it's a poem. Meaning, you don't have to take it literally. Almost no one nowadays believes that the story of creation told in Genesis is a scientific fact. It is universally accepted that this is a poetic and beautiful story. From the liturgical poem of the first creation to the canticles of the heavenly Jerusalem, the inspired authors proclaim the plan of salvation as one vast divine blessing, and I'm sorry to tell you that comes from the catechism of the Catholic Church. It is not a poem. 
there are none of the characteristics of Hebrew poetry in the first chapter of Genesis. We know what Hebrew poetry looks like grammatically. This has none of those characteristics. <coughs> Second, we are not supposed to read it like a science textbook. The Bible was not intended to be a book of science. It is a book of religion dealing with man's relationship with God. To that we can say, thank God. So it's not intended to contain sweeping generalizations based on meager evidence, outstated notions, speculative theories, disproven conclusions, fraud, falsified data, and unsubstantiated claims. As soon as we attempt to use it as a book of science, for example, to explain the origin of our cosmos and the origin of all life, then we begin to contradict scientific fact. If you want, I'm sure you run up against this argument, just ask someone this, particularly if they're a science teacher, would you teach out of a science book that's 50 years old? They say, oh, no. You say, why? Because we don't believe that anymore. <laughs> right? No. Third, we can't read the Bible literally, yet religion has come a long way too. Large numbers of religious people today reject the idea that the Bible must be read literally. And as we said earlier in the, in the earlier presentation, truth is not depend, the, uh, determined by a vote. And uh, by the way, uh, to go with that quote that uh, Pam shared, okay, um, I've, I've heard another quote, okay? The majority has never been right in history. Intellectual leaders in the church were either intimidated or awed by the successes of the new sciences, thus Christendom gradually lost faith in the literal truth of Genesis 1 to 11 that was so strongly held by the fathers and doctors of the church and that even they even became embarrassed by their teaching, Father Borkowitz. From the act of faith we just prayed, I believe these and all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches because in revealing them you can neither deceive nor be deceived. I'd like to ask you just to meditate on that thought. God cannot deceive and he cannot be deceived. So where should we place our hope? Where should we drop our anchor? Finally, this was written for primitive and simple-minded people. Until a theology of primitive man based on the present scientific evidence finally evolves, it should be remembered that the Bible says God created, and this can be taken in the broadest sense, mankind, not simply a man called Adam. If we accept this primitive interpretation of Genesis, then there is no possibility of evolution. Like Okay, here's a question. Which idea gives more glory to God that by his infinite power, wisdom, and love he called all things into existence in six days or that in his infinite power, wisdom, and love he slowly created all things over eons of time that are metaphorically called the days? How do we answer that question? Which one gives God more glory? The one that is true, not the one that we like. That has nothing to do with it. Getting our heads on straight, the doctrines of Genesis 1 to 4 from Father Walkowitz. A supreme being exists and has revealed himself. God created the world from nothing. God created a good world. God created everything in the world immediately. God created, well, we have to understand what that means. Uh, God created each living creature according to its kind. God created the world in six natural days. Okay, put that together with what do we mean immediately, what immediately meant. That when he did call something into existence, all right, it came immediately. God created the world several thousand years ago. God created man in his image and likeness. God created the first man immediately from the earth. God created the first woman immediately from the body of the first man. God gave man dominion over all creation. God created the first man and woman in a state of happiness and innocence. The first man and woman sinned and lost the state of happiness and innocence. The whole human species descended from first man and woman. So those are the doctrines that we can clearly draw from the first chapters of Genesis. And so the battle is raging, but we didn't start the battle. One of the most chilling statements I find in all of scripture is this one from Luke 18. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Why would he ask that question?
If the universe was not created in six days, then God created an imperfect world. The world was never very good. We are not fallen, but simply incomplete. Original sin must be redefined. Redemption loses its meaning. Christ is not our Savior, but simply an exemplar. The scriptures cannot be trusted. We cannot explain the seven-day week around the world, and the Sabbath loses its meaning. Let me quickly go through this in conclusion from the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Romans. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, the Jew first and then the Greek. For in it is revealed the righteousness of God from faith to faith, that is, as it is written, the one who is righteous by faith will live. The wrath of God is indeed being revealed from heaven against every impiety and wickedness of those who suppress the truth by their wickedness. For what can be known about God is evident to them because God made it evident to them. Ever since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes of eternal power and divinity have been able to be understood and perceived in what he has made. As a result, they have no excuse. For although they knew God, they did not accord him glory as God or give him thanks. Instead, they became vain in their reasonings and their senseless minds were darkened. While claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for the likeness of an image of mortal man or of birds or of four-legged animals or of snakes. Therefore, God handed them over to impurity through the lust of their hearts for the mutual degradation of their bodies. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and revered and worshipped the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Therefore, God handed them over to degraded passions. Their females exchanged natural relations for unnatural, and the males likewise gave up natural relations with females and burned with lust for one another. Males did shameful things with males and thus received in their own persons the due penalty of their perversity. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God handed them over to their undiscerning minds to do what is improper. They are filled with every form of wickedness, evil, greed, and malice, full of envy, murder, rivalry, treachery, and spite. They are gossips and scandal mongers, and they hate God. They are insolent, haughty, boastful, and genius in their wickedness, and rebellious toward their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless, although they know the just decree of God that all who practice such things deserve death. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. Skip this. Part of the, uh, one of the arguments we hear, we cannot afford another Galileo case. I would encourage you to read an actual history of Galileo case. 2 Timothy 1, 7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sobriety. In some other translations, you see the word comes out very clearly. Fear, cowardice, timidity, okay? And we need not be intimidated. We need to understand that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Last, uh, last slide here. <clears throat> If we were really going to be honest, okay, we would encourage those who hold to the doctrine of evolution should pray a prayer of honesty like this. All my fellow human beings, I went to a, um, an ecumenical service, I guess, you know, interfaith service at a Jewish synagogue, and I noticed that none of the prayers were addressed to God. They were addressed to the people. So, this is the type of prayer, perhaps, that ought to be prayed. All my fellow humans, I firmly believe that evolution is a fact necessitating millions of years to bring us to the point we now enjoy. I believe that random natural forces have brought all things into existence and will continue to perfect us well into the future. I believe these and all the truths which science teaches, because science can neither deceive nor be deceived. Let us stand and pray once again our act of faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Oh my God, I firmly believe that you are one God in three divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I believe that your divine Son became man, died for our sins, and that he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe these and all the truths which the Holy Catholic Church teaches because you have revealed them who can neither deceive nor be deceived. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let us go in peace.